So this video is on Romans uh, 12 and 13. So the first part of Romans is a theological argument in which, in my opinion, Paul is defending the gospel that he preaches. Uh, in, my scenario, in my understanding of Romans, Paul is writing Romans because he senses that his mission is completed in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Now he wants to push west. And particularly, he says in chapter 15, he wants to push into Spain. And so he wants to use Rome as a kind of base camp to launch a mission into Spain, which means he needs to introduce himself to the Roman church. And he also needs, uh, I think he wants to defend himself against some of the bad uh, rumors about what he actually thinks that have been circulating. And so what Paul does is he writes this defense of his understanding of the gospel. And in the first 11 chapters, we have kind of the theological part where he mounts a defense of the gospel as he understands it. So then we have this pivot at Romans 12.1. Therefore, given everything that went before, it indicates a logical cause-effect relationship between Romans 1 through 11 and now what he's going to say in chapters 12 through 15. It's not that 12 through 15 aren't theological. Obviously, they're theological too. Uh, but they're more like the practical uh, uh, conclusions that we reach on the basis of theology. So um, Romans 1 through 11 gives kind of theological background to Romans 12 through 15, which is the practical payoff or the practical, how do we live this? What does this look like in the way we're, we're going to live in life? So just to give detail, how, in what way, again, I've been telling you, but in what way does Romans 12 through 15 give us the logical consequence of Romans 1 through 11? So, given that, what have we seen in chapters 1 through 11? Given that God, the gospel demonstrates God's righteousness, given that God has demonstrated his righteousness through the sacrificial obedience of Christ, given that we find peace with God and are justified by faith in God, given that that's no excuse to sin, and given that God has not abandoned Israel. So this is this is a recap I'm giving you of the first 11 chapters. Given all that stuff, therefore, 12, 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, to present your flesh, to present your bodies. I mean, he says bodies, but this echoes what he said about flesh earlier in Romans 1 through through 8. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Remember what he said, not to present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, back in chapter 6? Don't do that. Don't present your instruments as instruments to sin, but present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And have a renewed and transformed mind, which is not, this is not about some abstract cognitive worldview. That would be exactly the, I mean, that would not be the way to take this. Paul is not talking about ideology here. That's a very Western way to think of it. Desiccated ideology, abstraction. That's not what Paul means by mind, and that's certainly not what Paul means by a transformed mind. By a transformed mind, Paul means that we have a loving attitude toward the world, uh, that, that our orientation is not um, uh, toward uh, hate or the flesh, we don't have a, we are not, the, remember what he says in chapter 8, the, the person that is minded according to the flesh is, is not minded, uh, or that might, I might be thinking Galatians here, but the, the person that is minded toward the flesh is at, is at enmity toward God. It's the person who is minded toward the spirit uh, that has the attitude of Christ. And so when Paul talks about a transformed mind, he means being minded according to the spirit not according to the flesh. This is about how we live. This is not about ideas or worldview. Uh, this is about attitudes uh, that show up in our life. What does it look like? Um, so, he's going to tell us. Chapters 12 through 15 of Romans, Paul tells us what it means to, be my, having a tra to have a transformed and renewed mind. The particulars of Romans 12 through 15 are going to tell us what it means to have a transformed mind. And here's how it looks. So, for example, a person with a transformed mind doesn't think too highly of himself or herself. A person with a transformed mind shows love to brothers and enemies. Again, this is not, oh, a transformed mind means that you have the right presuppositions. No, that's not at all what Paul is talking about. So anachronistic. Paul is talking about having the right attitude toward others, 
primarily when he talks about having a transformed mind. Um, a transformed mind submits to those in authority in chapter 13. So I'm kind of giving you the outline or the kind of the, the parts of this last section of Romans. So somebody with a transformed mind loves others, submits to those in authority, uh, loves their neighbor as themselves, and doesn't divide the church. Somebody with a transformed mind does not divide the church over disagreements. This is, this is quite different from what you hear some people talk about when they talk about this, this verse. But this is what Paul's talking about. We can see it inductively. By transformed mind, he's talking about the way we love one another and, and others. So let's go back and look at Romans 12, 3 through 13, 14. That's the uh, don't think too highly of yourself part and submit to those in authority over you part. So this entire section of, of the last part of Romans is generalized by Paul when he says, the one who loves his or her neighbor has fulfilled the law. That sums it up. What is a transformed mind? 13.8. That's what a transformed mind. A transformed mind loves your neighbor as yourself. And that's the fulfillment of the law. Uh, Jesus says it. Paul says it. John says it. James uh, implies it that basically the person who loves others, love God, love neighbor, that's the whole law. Everything in the Old Testament that is binding on the Christian, uh, there's no nothing else. The only thing that is binding on a Christian, uh, something that we should delight to do, I mean, I say binding, but we should delight to do it. The only thing that God expects of us is to love him and to love our neighbor as ourself. Everything else is summed up in that. Love is the fulfillment of the law, Paul says. Uh, in chapter 13, verse 10. This actually helps us go back and clarify some statements earlier in Romans that we may or may not have understood. So when Paul says in Romans 2.14 that there might be some Gentiles who do not have the law, uh, by nature they don't have the law, they're not born Jews, but they still do the things required by the law, hmm, uh, that is basically, now we know, loving, they, these are Gentiles who love their neighbors themselves. Obviously it doesn't mean the whole law, because a Gentile isn't circumcised by definition. So a Gentile can't keep the whole law, um, uh, even though they don't have the law, because by definition, they're not circumcised and aren't keeping the law. So Paul must mean, when he says that there are some Gentiles who demonstrate the law written on their heart, he must mean they keep some kind of core law, some essence of the law. And now we find out what it is. The core essence of the law is to love your neighbors yourself. And Paul is basically saying, that if there's some Gentiles who demonstrate the love of God and the love of neighbor, uh, their uncircumcision will be counted as circumcision. Meanwhile, a, a unbelieving Jew who doesn't demonstrate love toward their neighbor uh, will, will demonstrate that their circumcision is actually uncircumcision. So we, we have some clarity on 2.14 now that we know what Paul thinks is the fulfillment of the law, namely to love your neighbor. Similarly, in chapter 8, verse 4, he says, um, uh, there's now no condemnation, for the law of the Spirit has set you free uh, from the law of sin and death. For the impossibility of the law, God made possible by sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. Um, and then he gets to verse 4, so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Paul is so ethical, as I've argued. Ethics, ethics. It's about walking. Walking in newness of life. It's not some legal fiction. He's not talking about that. He's talking about actual change in, in behavior. And so when he says that the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us, he is, I think, now we can go back and say, talking about loving your neighbors yourself. By the way, another verse I don't have on here is Romans 3.31, where he says, Therefore, do we nullify law? No, we establish law. What does he mean by that? Again, he thinks, I think he, he means, therefore, that we establish love of neighbor as the heart of the Jewish law. So we, we now can clarify some comments that might have been ambiguous up to this point in Romans, that he does think that we don't have to sin. We don't have to sin. We shouldn't. In fact, we must not sin. And what does that mean? That means that we must love our neighbors ourselves, because that is the person who loves their neighbor is a person who does not sin. Um, okay, so the love of neighbor, love of God, love of neighbor, these are the Christian absolutes to end all absolutes. What is an absolute? An absolute is an ethical maxim to which there is no exception. There is no exception to God's command to love God, love neighbor. Um, love neighbor doesn't contradict the love of God, so there's no exception you know, made to the love of neighbor command for the love of God. Love of neighbor always 
fits with the love of God. These go hand in hand. In fact, the primary way uh, in our day-to-day -day life that we demonstrate our love for God is by um, loving our neighbor as ourself. Most of the other ethical commands have exceptions to them, but these two are absolute. There are no exceptions um, to these commands. Uh, they are timeless and they are universal. It is impossible for all ethical maxims to be absolute. There, have to, there has to be a hierarchy where you make an exception to a lower ethical maxim uh, because of a higher one. And the highest of all ethical maxims are the maxims to love God and to love our neighbor. These are the foundational absolutes of all Christian ethics. So, in 12, 3 through 13, we get some examples, some concrete, specific examples of how to show a transformed mind by loving one another within the church. So, um, we have some illustrations of the body of Christ in Romans 12. And, of course, this reminds us of uh, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Uh, that's not 12 through 4, that's 12 through 14. Um, some examples in, in 1 Corinthians 12 uh, of, of how we are not to look down on other parts of the body of Christ. I have one gift, you have another gift. We shouldn't look down on each other. That's all part of having a transformed mind. A, transformed, a person with a transformed mind doesn't think they're better than everybody else. Um, we are one body, but we are many, many members. Um, so things like prophecy, uh, some, some people are prophets, some people are servants. Uh, we should all be servants, of course, but some people are particularly good at serving others. Some people are teachers, some people are encouragers, some people are givers, some people are leaders, uh, some people show mercy. Again, I don't think that we should see, oh, I'm sorry, I can't give, I'm a server, or I mean, I, I'm a teacher, I can't give, or I, I'm a, a mercy shower, so I can't lead. I don't think that's what Paul's saying. I really don't. In fact, I think that would be a bad, a bad way to take this. But I do think we do tend to have certain gifts and not others. Um, and so we should not look down on those who don't have our gifts, and they shouldn't look at, down at us because we don't have their gifts. This is part of having a transformed mind. This is part of what it means to love our neighbor as ourself, even within the church. And again, there's some miscellaneous love going around um, in these uh, verses here. Um, so in uh, chapter uh, 12, we hear about brotherly love in verse 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly and sisterly love. He, he may say brotherly, but he means the sisters as well. We are to honor others above ourselves. So we're not to cling to, I mean, this is mine, mine, my stuff. You know, that's not a Christian attitude. Christians are not hoarders. Uh, Christians are sharers. Um, uh, having a spiritual fervor, he mentions. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep spiritual fervor. Uh, verse 11. Uh, joy, he talks about joy. Be faith, joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful uh, in prayer. Practice hospitality. Uh, share with those in need, um, he says. So these are all examples, uh, not only of what it means to love your neighbors yourself, but of having a transformed mind because we have the Holy Spirit uh, inside of us. Um, so the ones that I mentioned on the previous slide, 12, 3 through 13, tended to be within the church. Uh, Paul goes on in 12, 14 through 3, 7 to talk about demonstrations of love outside the church. Um, and indeed, uh, this is also examples of what it means to have a transformed mind. Verse 14, 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Uh, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Um, again, great, great advice there. Um, sometimes we forget it. In fact, I think sometimes we get so twisted. Um, and we almost make uh, what is what is considered evil in Bible and make it into a virtue. Um, strange, strange thing, fallen human nature. Do not repay evil with evil, but be careful to do what is right uh, in the eyes of others. Now, of course, sometimes others are wrong about what is right, but, but there is uh, um, something to be said for behaving honorably. Live at peace, if it is possible. <laughs> I like that. As much as it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You can't live at peace with everyone because there are some people who are determined uh, to create conflict. I hope I'm not one of them. Uh, but there are some people who, 
um, you, there's just not going to be peace. There's going to be conflict with that person. And so Paul says, you know, as much as it depends on you, as much as it is possible, live at peace with everyone. But I think there's a hint there that we all know that, uh, you know, there's just some people you, they're just going to be in conflict with you no matter what you do. No matter what you do, no matter what tactic you take, you know that they're going to be, um, you know, you're, it's, something's going to be wrong no matter what uh, course of action you take. Uh, and, and usually the best thing in that circumstance is just not to engage. Don't engage. Uh, try not to, to, to um, set them off. Just, um, you know, if you, if you have to be around them, you have to be around them. But um, do not take revenge. Leave room for God's wrath. Isn't that great? In 1219, God, God's got, I mean, that's jo God's job. Don't take God's job away from him. Judgment is God's job. Um, it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Um, in contrast, if, you're, if our enemy is hungry, this is verse 20. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap coals, uh, burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Um, this sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Um, sometimes scholars debate whether Paul knew much Jesus tradition. Well, it sure sounds like Jesus tradition uh, here. Uh, and so this would be some of the main candidates for uh, Paul's knowledge of, of Jesus tradition. Again, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just completely befuddled at how many Christians make the bad m into the good. I mean, Paul says, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. Um, and how many Christians basically, no, no, uh, kill your enemy, shoot him. Uh, we're just all twisted. We're not biblical Christians. We're not, uh, so many. Uh, I'm, I, and I, I'm sure I'm not as well. Um, it's, a, it's a very sobering thought to read this list and to think of how many times even the church uh, seems to advocate for positions that have nothing to do with, with what Jesus and Paul uh, taught. Um, submit to authority. So we get to chapter 13. God has approved of the authorities that exist. Now, um, I don't want to get into the predestination thing. Paul does have a, a fatalist uh, kind of tone sometimes. Um, uh, and this is one of those places where, uh, at least on the surface, it sounds like he's basically saying God has dictated who, who's in office. Um, but I don't think that um, Paul is, uh, I don't think Paul would advocate us just doing nothing when we have the chance to, to vote, for example. I think Paul would, uh, if, if he lived today, I think he would encourage Christians uh, to vote. Paul didn't live in that kind of world. Uh, being a world changer in terms of changing the government, that just wasn't something that was really on the table in Paul's day. Um, but basically, uh, I do think that, I mean, the principle that I take away from this passage uh, is that we do need to respect those who are in authority over us. So we need to respect our bosses. Uh, we need to respect um, our, our elected officials. Sometimes it's hard when we don't agree with what the elected officials do. Um, but, you know, remember David didn't kill Saul when he had the chance because he didn't want to touch the Lord's anointed. Um, certainly, you know, Nero was the one who was emperor when Paul was writing this. Nero was the one that would later put Paul to death and behead him. And I don't think Paul had any illusions about, I don't think Paul thought that Nero was a righteous kind of good guy. I doubt that very seriously. Um, sometimes it's said that Nero wasn't quite so bad. What was Nero, three or four years into his reign when Paul wrote this? Uh, but I don't think Paul had any illusions about uh, Roman officials being righteous. Um, he's setting out the way it should be, uh, and he's setting out the respect that we should have. So we need to have respect for those uh, who are in power, um, even when we think that they're not doing a good job, or even when we think they're evil, even when we think they're criminals. And again, I, I don't think if Paul lived in our world, he would say, you know, don't, uh, don't blow the whistle. I think Paul would be in favor of blowing the whistle on evildoers um, in our context. But so my takeaway from this passage is that Paul is saying we need to respect those who are in authority over us, even when uh, they are unjust or incompetent. Um, rulers do not bring fear to the one who does good, uh, but to the one who does evil. Of course, this is the theory. Um, this is the way it should be. 
Um, as we know, it often isn't the case, and I'm not, I'm not trying to contradict Paul here. I'm saying, um, and you know, you have to wonder, uh, if I were Paul, I certainly wouldn't uh, put down on paper in a letter I'm sending to Rome, subversive thoughts about Rome. I mean, ar around uh, the water cooler, uh, Paul might have been a little more frank about the unrighteousness of, of Nero. Um, so this is, this is the, the ideal. This is the way it's supposed to work. We all know that rulers often do bring fear to those who do good. Uh, but this is the way it's supposed to work. This is what the government is supposed to, to do. And Paul does, is not anti-government in the slightest. In fact, he says, pay your taxes. I've never understood Christians who say, um, as a matter of conscience, I don't pay taxes. Uh, Paul and Jesus both say to pay your taxes. Uh, and, and anybody who thinks that taxes um, in, say, uh, the United States today are anything near as unjust as, as taxes in the Roman Empire, uh, that's just not the case. Uh, taxes today are nothing. Uh, taxes today are nothing compared to 40, 50 years ago, um, and they're nothing, uh, certainly the un injustice of taxes today is nothing compared to the injustice of taxes in the Roman Empire. Basically, there's no excuse uh, for not paying your taxes, at least not biblically. Um, honor those in authority over you, even when they're Nero, uh, Paul says here. So those are some hard words. Again, I, I don't think that Paul is saying that um, we can't vote out uh, officials that we think are bad or incompetent, or that we can't work for change. I don't think that's I, I don't think that's the takeaway here. I think the takeaway is that we need to be respectful toward those who are in authority uh, over us, um, and submit to them, submit willingly. Um, and of course, if there's a moment for change, then that's a time for change. Well, um, Paul ends this section with uh, some verses about uh, the signs of the time. Uh, he says, The hour has come for you to wake up for, from your slumber, because salvation is closer now than when we first believed. Of course, that's, that's true. Every moment that goes by, salvation is closer. You can see that salvation for Paul is primarily future tense uh, from this quote. Uh, I don't think Paul had any idea that it would be 2,000 years later and salvation still wouldn't be here. Uh, but that's okay. We need to live as if we're uh, ready. The night is nearly over. We need to live as if Jesus could come back any moment. And in the meantime, let's lay aside uh, the, the days of deeds of darkness. Let's put on the armor of light. Let's not. Let's behave uh, decently, as in the daytime. Not in orgies. Not in drunkenness. Not in sexual immorality. Not in debauchery. Not in dissension uh, and and jealousy. Let's not uh, gratify the desires of our flesh. This verse, by the way, 13.13, um, 13, was the verse that the Lord used to convict St. Augustine uh, because he, uh, he felt guilty about uh, his uh, sexual sins up until his conversion. Uh, he probably, I would say, went the opposite direction too far in being anti-sexual pleasure um, as a, when he became a Christian. But this, this verse about debauchery and uh, dissension and jealousy in his confessions, I believe, uh, he says, was the, the tool that God used to bring him to conversion. God uses different tools to bring different people to different points. So that concludes um, an, an overview of Romans 12 and Romans 13.